I'm here to kind of help you uh, get through this uh, evening. And uh, I'm hoping to offer another way to look at all this. And from a psychiatrist's point of view, maybe we can look at it a little differently. This first slide, uh, that's me. Uh, no, no, not really, not really. I always wanted to say that. I'm a little delusional, yes. So this is a, a real hero of mine, Nick Walenda, if you can see the fine print, as he edges his way along the tightrope uh, along Niagara Falls. Four years ago, four years ago last night, uh, this is the fourth anniversary, and I, I love Nick Walenda because he's the most unassuming, uh, down-to-earth, kind of guy. You'd never pick him out of a lineup. It's, it's incredible. Very spiritual. And the beauty of this is he made it look easy. And I know he practiced for many years. And I think it's how sometimes us providers must feel. And I have the deepest of respect for you folks. I have to say that. And what a beautiful thing to see people from Guthrie and Lourdes and UHS uh, getting together and the camaraderie and the collegiality. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dave, I'm not so sure about you, but that's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, we all took an oath to care for people, and it, it's really a, a higher calling, and I, I think it's an important thing to kind of, you know, remind ourselves of. We each work with our own rope, in a way, you know, and we spend years strengthening it through uh, education and on-the-job experiences, and we all do it without the benefit of a net. Uh, think about it. We focus on the needs of others, much often, more often than we do our own needs. And it's no wonder that providers are suffering an epidemic of burnout. Uh, it's easy to forget why we got into this in the first place, isn't it? And we each have our own stories. Nick Walenda lost his grandfather at a hotel in Puerto Rico doing this kind of stunt. Nick was just nine years old, and you can imagine it must have had an impact on, on him. And I'd ask us to remind ourselves, you know, what motivated us to get into this in the first place? So why do I bring this up at a Disrep talk? It really doesn't seem to make sense, but it's the first thing I thought of because the reality is that none of us work in a vacuum, that we each, you know, feel the distractions in life, the emails, uh, the computer messages, the new initiatives. Gosh, there's new initiatives, isn't there? And the one thing you can count on, whatever's new today is gonna to be gone tomorrow. Nothing seems to sustain. And for Nick, can you imagine the, the blinding mist? Can you imagine the darkness out there on his own? The winds, the crowds, the, the noise, distractions? You believe it. And it's easy to grow cynical and tired and, and look at things in a negative light. And I have to confess, you know, when I first heard about Disrep, I wasn't the most positive uh, guy, you know, going in, in regards to it. And so, you know, we tend to focus on barriers. And I stole all of these slides, by the way. Not one of them did I make up on my own, just so you know that. But here's a, a slide talking about barriers to change. And I, I thought this was a really kind of neat slide in talking about Disrep, because Disrep represents a lot of change for all of us. And nobody likes change, you know? Let's face it, uh, it's a tough thing. The unknown, you know, the scary things uh, about that. I was thinking tonight also about Disrup. It's on a five-year mission, much like Star Trek was. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't end after five years, did it? So I'm waiting to see if there's gonna be a Disrup movie and part one and two and all the rest of it. So anyhow, tonight is for you, especially the primary care providers out here. I really, I want to emphasize this, that this is an introduction. It's an invitation to get you involved, to get you interested, to have you uh, join us, because this is not perfect. You know, if you sat through and listened to even half of it tonight, I'm sure you sat there thinking, this isn't going to work, or I don't get it, or it's, it's just not right. And that's okay, you know, I, I think we want you though to then give the feedback, you know. So I think the question and answer period, if there's time for it, I don't know how much time is left tonight, but there'll be future events. And I really want to encourage everyone to please try to get involved here. Don't, you know, don't shy away from this. Uh, we tend to focus on barriers. Donald Trump, 
That's a great, great way to get everyone to listen. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump has a saying, and the saying is, without passion, you don't have energy, and without energy, you have nothing. And that has been on my bulletin board for probably the last 10 years, long before Donald Trump was Donald Trump. So it's, it's not a question of whether we participate with this, this rep stuff or not. We have to. And one of my colleagues at a previous clinical governance committee said, if you're not sitting at the table, then you might just be on the menu. You know, so food for thought. Like that pun? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the key to success here is collaboration among all of us, among the providers, the non-providers, and the systems that provide care currently. And I have a case example. I love talking about cases. So this is a case, and it kind of reminds me of Project 3AII, III, uh, crisis stabilization in the community. The idea of that project, Dave was telling us, is to come up with some other ways to intervene simply by saying go to the ER or get into the hospital. So we have an intake meeting at Lord Center for Mental Health where I kind of spend my days. And we had a chance to review intakes. That's why it's called an intake meeting with social workers. And it, it's a brief discussion usually. In this case we had was a 16 year old. And she's a young lady who's referred after a hospital stay at Greater Binghamton, a great facility in town here. Uh, she's been known to us from prior care and they were referring her back. Diagnosed with several conditions, including depression, oppositional defiant disorder. Stabilized in the past with medications and therapy, but ended up apparently hospitalized after an explosive episode at home. I'll ask you the same thing Dave asked. Did anyone ever hear of a case like this? Yeah, okay. So she stays in the hospital about 10 days and was referred to a crisis residence in the community. No medication adjustments were deemed necessary. There is a history of her requiring prior placements where her behavioral issues quickly stabilized. <coughs> Apparently she was tried on a home pass and that ended up in a physical altercation with her mother and her dad actually had to get involved to restrain her, unfortunately. Police were not called this time, but had been in the past. And we have this program in town, a great program, the Adolescent Crisis Program, but it only allows for 14 day stays. And our staff, staff honestly felt overwhelmed. I would even say demoralized because clearly a new placement was in order, but how to make this happen quickly was beyond our controls. We have referred her for SPOA services, which are enhanced outpatient services in our, in our area here. But there's a waiting list for a case manager and other programs that help intervene with families like this. The decision was made that the police should be called if there is acting out, but another hospital stay is simply not the right answer. Another visit to the ER is avoidable, and I would call it inappropriate because a community intervention could really rule the day here. She does not require program staff with 24-hour nurses. There's no need for medical and psychiatric components to go into this, the things that you really need in a hospital stay. This is not a medical disorder that required medication adjustment. It's a psychosocial issue. And we need the resources to be voted away from the hospital and into the community care to deal with cases like this. And this is not an uncommon uh, scenario. So none of us would argue that the healthcare system is broken, isn't it? And I think there is potential here with DISRIP to try to fill some of the cracks. It's not a panacea. And no matter what happens, the basic equation is always going to be the same. It's that connection between the provider and the patient. And nothing, no change is going to get in the way of that. We don't have to worry about that. That will be a constant. That is my rope in terms of getting from one end of the, the beginning of the session to the end. I always keep that in mind. The emails, the new initiatives, the rest of it go to the side. And I'm there to advocate to be with my patient. My second main point tonight is to really recognize the value of behavioral data and behavioral health in, in particular. And, and DISRIP gets it. DISRIP gets it. Medicaid in our area, I think Dave mentioned, 31% of the Medicaid members are behavioral health recipients. Huge. These people cost three times more per recipient for the system. Three times. 
and represent 58% of total Medicaid spending in our area. So it's no surprise to me that three out of 11 projects are gonna have behavioral health and substance abuse in them, is it? It should be that way. And I congratulate and thank the people at DISREP for recognizing that this is a huge unmet need. Let's go to slide three. Slide three is talking about the barriers from a patient's point of view. Significant obstacles remain and no doubt stigma I think is the biggest issue. And I'll share with you another case example and this case comes from Project 3AI. And this is uh, over at Robinson Street, a few miles from here. And there's a note I, I was able to, uh, was copied to me from Kate. So a social worker there. And she says, hi team. It's a team. It's not just one person, but it's a group of us, or a group of them working together. Hi team, I just wanted to celebrate a success. I spoke with a patient on the phone today. They've been doing these PHQ-9s as part of the DISREP project. This is 3AI, so they have a, a mental health intervention in the primary care setting, PHQ-9. He scored a 15 and was not referred to me, rather he was referred to a psychiatric service in the community. She called the patient anyhow due to his score. So I think she went above and beyond, I'll give her credit on that. Patient reported he was given a list of mental health facilities. <laughs> However, he denied wanting to go to any of these places. And to use her quotes, they are not private, unquote. The patient continued to express his reluctance to go to a known mental health facility. The stigma of it was a real turnoff. I informed him of our project of implementing behavioral health in primary care. He sounded relieved. He immediately agreed to come in for an appointment with me. And he thanked me multiple times and I scheduled him to see, see me next week. I made sure to write a special note to the provider informing them of the interaction. That wasn't there before the pilot that we have with Disrop. So I found a ton of slides, you know, on barriers for patients, and there's so many of them. And, you know, denial, you know, lack of awareness, uh, not really believing the treatment would help is another big one. And let me go now to my next slide. And this is the literature I found in terms of barriers for clinicians dealing with mental health. Seriously. It's a pretty cool slide. So, I said, you know what, I am gonna make a slide. So I made the next slide. This might look familiar. <laughs> Francine, what do you think? You've seen it before. So, I, you know, we have our own stigmas to confront as providers, let's face it. You know, it's hard for us to get into the emotional aspects of things and time, oh my gosh, time. If I only had more time. You can buy a watch, but you can't buy time. Think about it. I feel like I'm running out of time right now. But we're all worried about this, aren't we? And I think it affects the very nature of what we do. It's also why these payers want to focus on value rather than volume, isn't it? value rather than volume, quality rather than quantity, but how will that look if nobody seems to know at this point? I mean, I sat through Dr. Fish's talk and I kind of sort of get it, but I'm still, I'm still confused about it. Ironically, so far in DISREP, it's kind of funny to me that they pay per whatever you do, per survey, it's still paying for quantity. And I know this is gonna change. You know, I'm just wondering, and that may be a question, how is that gonna change? So, I have to say something else about time, and it's my own pet peeve, which is open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are so wonderful. You know, think about it, someone comes in, how are you Mrs. Smith today, what brings you here? I don't know why Mrs. Smith keeps getting picked on, but how long does it take for us to interrupt? Anybody have an idea? 10 seconds, 12 seconds, 16 seconds, and we're on to whatever it is, is the next thing. We don't listen in an active way, and that's not the good. That's not good for, the, for us, it's not good for the person we're trying to help. And it turns out a lot of times issues are camouflaged. They take time. 
The good news is, the little bit of studies I saw, the more you use open-ended questions, the shorter the sessions become. Exactly the opposite of what you would worry about if you just sat there and let the person talk. Interesting. The biggest elephant in the room, I have to say, uh, you know, might just be politics. Can you believe it? We work in silos, I love that word. And the system encourages gaming of the system. It's really quite upsetting, isn't it? In behavioral health, there's simply not enough. You know, there's no way to say that differently. Society and the news would suggest that we need more, but when it comes time for paying, the room gets very quiet. If there's a cut to be made, no doubt it's gonna to be to mental health or substance abuse treatment. Healthcare is a business, and business principles just don't apply to healthcare. Think about it. No respect, disrespect to Dr. Fish, I, I liked your talk very much, but Albany has not become well known as a home for ethical and law-abiding politicians. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it is. No doubt there's gonna be a lack of trust. But there's politics everywhere, even in our own institutions, there's politics. And so it's impossible to escape that reality. But we need to advocate. It's what's in our patient's best interest that needs to carry the day. Otherwise, we're gonna be doomed. A colleague said at one of our meetings, I can't believe it, I'm now part of the establishment. And you know, it's really uh, kind of upsetting when I think about it. So I don't necessarily see myself that way. Last slide. This slide talks about the medical model versus patient-centered model. I almost feel like we should have lounge chairs here tonight because it's kind of like looking up, but that's okay. In the patient-centered model, which I also consider kind of the recovery model, the patient's role is active. It's on them. They're, they're the leader, you know, we're the partner. And I want to use this slide because it really is a plug for that recovery model. It's ironic to me that people in this room and, and outside are not more familiar with the recovery model because it would make our lives a lot easier. I think it would help us to sustain if we just thought about this more. To be more effective in the care that we provide, doesn't it make sense to let the person that's in the room with us have a bigger role to play? Giving up control is not the worst thing in the world and we don't have to rule ourselves out in terms of having a role to play. Think about it, sitting in the passenger seat while the consumer drives does not mean that we have nothing to offer them. After all, how many of you have taken long drives? Everybody, right? Isn't it a lot more fun to have someone on the trip with you? That ability to share the moment? But think about it also, if that other person's negative, if they're shut down, if they're cynical, if they're low energy, what then? I would even say burned out. We don't want them along, would you? And so I ask you to think about it when people come back and they haven't done what you suggested, who's that on? Is that us or is it them? Did we listen to them and give them a chance to say what they had to say? In this model, the provider listens more and talks less. What's the problem here? We can listen or hear about 500 words a minute, but we can only talk about 150. My mother-in-law used to be able to do a little faster, but about 150. So you have this discrepancy between what you can actually hear and, and what, and that's bad news because you're gonna be sidetracked with emails, multitasking, right? We're supposed to reward that, but not in this setting, I don't think. I don't think it's the best thing. So. Last thought. Tonight, you know, I really think of Disrep in a much more compassionate way. I have to tell you that. I've totally changed my thinking because at first I told you I was kind of cynical. I thought this is another state gimmick to cut payments to hospitals and providers. But it's not really just about cutting. It's not cutting at all. It's money that was brought back from the federal level and reinvested. This, we're not talking about cutting out jobs. We're talking about moving jobs away from traditional settings, the hospital and ER, into the outpatient and other areas in the community to try to help us 
to help our patients. And ultimately, we're going to be helping not only that, ourselves. It's good for us. We're going to feel better. Our patients hopefully will feel better. Our family members are going to benefit. I'm going to need help someday myself, aren't I? I want this system to succeed, you know, for the benefit of everybody. So uh, that's about it. I don't have much else to offer you. Uh, sorry if I overspoke, but I had to say what I had to say. So thank you.